Okay, I think we're live. Um, so I was thinking about when I first met you mm. about how um, you were at Victrola in Seattle. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's so many stories of things where, like kind of stories lost to his coffee history. And yeah. I, when I tell the story, I, bl not blame, but I, you're like the origin story of like VST baskets. <laughs> you think so? Well, because of your competition experience. Yeah. So, so I have a tissue. I'm uh, having a little bit of an allergy thing from yesterday. I was telling Kyle earlier. Um, yeah, because it's your first breezy competition. And I remember it very vividly. But yeah. when you get your, you got your tamper stuck in the port filter basket. I did. And as far as I'm concerned, that was sort of when at least for the Americans, like for a lot of us, that we learned that there could be issues with portafilter baskets and that they could be better. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, just think about what that era was generally. I mean, the portafilters were brass. The, like, head honchos at La Marzocco were saying they would never build an espresso machine with PID control. And that barista competition took place in front of an audience of just fellow competitors right and SC, scaa uh, uh volunteers in the basement of the seattle public library right to say that it was a different era i feel like is just like is such an understatement that if you come into into like third wave or specialty coffee in the last even just like the last decade like you couldn't possibly conceive of it it was so nerdy and fringe yeah and weird yeah it, it was and if you remember i mean this is a layer that you won't remember but i was involved in some of the industry politics at the time that competition was seen as an affront to coffee fest that was happening across the street it was sort of like glomming onto it and the coffee fest folks david Halbern, who was running coffee fest at the time was pissed yeah he was pissed. <clears throat> yeah anyway so anyway so we've got cog landville here Go get them, Tiger, G&B. Do you care which of the two sort of like companies that you're, like banners that you're flying under? Or do you always like to mention both? Um, oh, that's really interesting. I, I don't always like to mention both. I think it depends on the audience. I think if I'm talking to a coffee person, I'll say like uh, G&B. But if I'm talking to like an L.A. person, I'll say go get them, Tiger. I <laughs> got it. G&B, I think, has a little bit more... Uh, uh, awareness in the coffee industry, whereas Go Get Him Tiger is is really an LA thing. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. I got a little com question coming in. We'll get we'll get to these questions for sure. Um, cool. So, how many how many spots you got right now? Right now, yeah. <laughs> right now, right now we have six open, but we in theory have nine shops now. Uh -huh. So talk so talk about the go get them empire and like sort of how decisions have been made in terms of like what to open, what not to open, et cetera. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think we, we opened our first two shops within a month of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, after we did a pop-up in squirrel, we opened our first shop May, uh, which was GMB May 31st, uh, 2013 and June 28th, 2013, we opened go get them tiger on March month which is mm. pretty bananas when you think about it. And to be totally honest, um, I thought based off of my experience at Intelligentsia and the, the still sort of the, the dearth of options in Los Angeles and in these neighborhoods, I thought that we were going to be popping off from day one mm. and learned a really hard lesson there because uh, we were not. Uh, it's never quite all. like that, yeah. It was like that with Intelli, though. I mean, I can't even... Like, when we opened Intelligentsia in Silver Lake, by the third day, we had two-hour waits for coffee. And, uh, I mean, obviously, they had the history of the company coming into L.A., but... Right. Uh, you know, I thought I thought we would have something not necessarily like that, but, but somewhat like that. So, Was there more PR kind of push for the Intelligentsia opening, or, not, or is it more organic? It was organic. Organic, you know, the thing about Intelligentsia is I, you know, I lived in L.A. and a lot of us lived in L.A. for nearly a year before we actually got that first shop open. And we spent that year, you know, there was there was obviously like planning and there was stuff to do. But 
in the downtime, we were just kind of like building community. So we were doing like all these like pop ups and like if anybody asked us like, hey, we're doing a preschool fundraiser, we'd be like, OK, we'll be there. Like, right. It didn't matter what it was like. We, we rolled around town with the GS3. And I think our little like sort of uh, suitcase uh, medicine show actually ended up like uh you know doing pretty well for us yeah uh, once we finally did get open but then also like there was just nothing even approaching you know any kind of third wave thing and i had i had moved from uh, from seattle you know and seattle had latte art and vivace <laughs> right and <laughs> And it was expected, but that you couldn't, you couldn't, uh, you know, I think there was one or two shops in all of LA, which is, you know, 11 million people in the greater LA area where you right. could actually get latte art. So it was a pretty big change. Right. And so it's interesting, you know, we can get back to this. I've been thinking a lot about the parallels between, it's not exactly the same, obviously, but there's certain parallels to draw between like that kind of heyday of when third wave specialty was, uh, was new. And, yeah. and, you know, you talk about latte art, like, you know, obviously you're talking about the idea that, like, a lot of people had never seen it before and react, yeah. reacted accordingly. And, and um, I want to tell you a funny story yeah. that just popped into my head. Uh, you know, Eileen Hassey, obviously mm -hmm. a ritual, legendary company, legendary coffee person. Yep. Great here, person. here in San Francisco. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. There, in the bay. Wait, hold so, on. I got to hit my I got to hit my air horn thing that you can't hear. <laughs> So, Eileen, I, <laughs> sorry, all right, I, I didn't hear it. But I, I, feel I it yeah, here. everyone else. Um, I, Eileen, when she was, I, when I, when I was working at Victrola, she, and I, I don't recall if Jeremy was there or not, but like, basically they were road tripping down to San Francisco to start this company. Right. And she popped into Victrola and she ordered a latte and I poured her a latte with latte art on it and set it in front of her. And she said to me, Oh, I'm gonna open a shop in San Francisco that does this, <laughs> <laughs> and it was so sweet and pure. And I was just kind of like, well, "Yeah, whatever, lady." <laughs> yes, I had the I had a similar experience. It was at the 2006 SCAA Expo in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, this was after uh, Vic, uh, Ritual had been open for a while and had famously long lines, and um, were on the cover of Barista magazine and everything. And so then I do finally meet, you know, this is when I'm still living in Washington, D.C. And she says to me, so you run two cafes? And I said, yeah. And she said, what's that like? <laughs> and I said, shut up. You, you're like one cafe is crushing my two. And yeah. you're like, you know, so beyond, like, I'm insulted that you would ask me this question. You're mocking me inadvertently. And she's like, like kind of like, oh, well, you know, whatever. I'm like, you're, you're, you have nothing to ask me. Like, I have nothing to teach you, yeah. I guess is what I said. Like, I have nothing yeah. to tell, tell you that you don't already know. Like, I should be asking yeah. you questions. And, of course, you look at Ritual impressive. now. I remember going to Ritual back when Gabe and Ryan and right. uh, all those folks, you know, yeah. who now are still doing cool stuff in coffee were, were on bar. So Great time. speaking of now doing cool stuff, so uh, talk about your multiple locations and how you're, how you've managed the this COVID crisis in terms of like, this, the initial decisions you've made uh, when sort of word first came and and how that's gone for you. So, um, two and a half weeks ago, Monday morning. The Monday before the Wednesday night where, like, the NBA shut down, where it was kind of like, oh, shit, this is so real. Right. We had an emergency meeting of uh, director-level staff um, at Go Get Him Tiger. And basically the meeting was uh, an acknowledgement that this was going to hit us really hard and probably quicker than we could imagine. And sort of preparing for like what we called like a phase one, phase two, phase three uh, kind of response to the thing. And our phase one response that we drafted that day is we did just like house rules. Uh, and we published our house rules and it was like no high fives, no handshakes, no hugs. <laughs> Don't touch the counters. Uh, you know, there's and, you know, we have hand sanitizer available and. You know, just like good hygiene. You had hand sanitizer? Where the hell did you get it from? We made it. Oh, did we you? Made, 
we made we got a bunch of alcohol and we made actually a wonderful hand sanitizer that smelled so good with essential oil and stuff. Is macadamia uh, nuts in it? No. <laughs> no, mac- it's almond macadamia <laughs> hand sanitizer. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we 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 basically got all that out, and you know, even though we we did that and we we started that like it was clear that like a lot of our customers were kind of like eh whatever and you know like our location we have a few locations that are really in sort of business areas uh-huh. and we were noticing already that a lot of those offices were going remote but the response you know amongst the community seemed really varied and it became clear to me in that moment that whatever sort of leadership was going to happen about how to deal with this at least in the early days was going to just be coming from private businesses and individuals, right? Which is not like historically how it works in this country, right? Um, usually, we wait for the word from the government, and even if like we think that you know the government is slimy, we can trust that in a crisis they're not going to like mislead us, so, right? Um, but this time it was sort of coming from us. So I, you know, this whole time, and I'm sorry if I'm bouncing around too much. It's okay. It's just every day you wake up with this huge moral dilemma where the right answer does not seem to clearly reveal itself at any moment. And so, you know, I think of, of what I've, what I've seen from a lot of my peers, right. Is they, they didn't have a plan and rather than, and, you know, even though our plan came together in the timing you know, ended up being last minute. It didn't feel last minute right. when we met. And but like a lot of these other companies didn't have a plan and then they just went from nothing to total shutdown. Right. And for me, you know, for better or for worse, I think one of the one of the things that is just true about me and Charles and a lot of our team is like we just like closing or like going to zero or ending the company or like, it's just not an option. We will, we will empty the clip. Yeah. Like we will, we will do everything that we can to keep this as alive as possible. And, you know, through the sort of like moral self doubt that comes with opening this public facing thing every day, you know, we basically emerged, have emerged a little bit from like the total, like, heads down moment to now kind of like looking at the broader landscape and just realizing like right now during this crisis we have two key focuses and there is a hierarchy the first one is employee security is number one and the second one is adding value for our community Mm -hmm. and so the employee security one is a very simple two words but a very complex thing to address right now um, and I think where we come down on it is nobody in our company has to work right now. That like for sure, nobody in our company has to show up to work if they don't feel like it. Um, it means that if they do show up to work, that we're doing everything we can with the best available practices to not become a factor in spreading COVID-19. Um, and and then beyond that, our employees have the agency to decide what kind of security is most important to them right now in this moment. Is it the peace of mind of staying home and staying out of the mix? Or is it the, you know, having work, having a job and having a paycheck? Are, um, are you letting those decisions be made at the cafe level then? Or is it more the individual level? It's the individual level. So, you know, we, we started almost right away with a big company wide survey and we asked people, you know, what they wanted uh, to happen for them uh, in this moment. Did they want to be laid off? Uh, did they, and, you know, keep in mind, we're more than baristas. You know, we have right. roastery, we have, you know, management team as well. You know, did they, did they want to be laid off? Did they want to work as much as possible? Or did they want us, or did they, did they have a preference to not work but need 
uh, some sort of financial uh, assistance. And, and so like we, we circulated that survey, we let everybody kind of uh, have their views known. And then we've made it clear, we have basically a daily sort of end of day dispatch that comes from me all the way to the team. We use Slack, um, which man, I wish I, I wish I owned Slack stock going into this. Uh, do you pay for Slack? We, we do. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, you're the one. Uh, yeah, it's us. Uh, so, you know, I put out a communication just sort of reminding everybody, you know, of their rights and sort of what the what the changes have looked like and what stuff we're planning for the company and everything like that. And and a big thing, you know, where we've been able to add value for, for our community is, is making sure that our team is aware of their rights right now. Um, because right now the, the momentum is... Lenders and landlords are are going to extend these like ninety day grace periods. Right. But in the end, there's the expectation is still that they will be made whole. Uh, whereas, you know, the people, the working class, nobody is setting any kind of expectation that they'll be made whole because the working class gets the you know, they, they live they they get shit on first in every scenario. Right. And so I'm just, you know, advocating we we created form letters for our staff to to not pay rent and you know if there is a rent or a a rent moratorium um wherever you live and you know you're relatively paycheck to paycheck i'm advocating that everybody no matter who you are not pay rent even if you have it keep it in the bank wait wait for this thing to blow over and then if you have it you pay it but if things get worse you have money in the bank Right. That's just, you know, for the audience, uh, if you have a car payment, call your the note holder on your car and defer. Everybody's deferring. Everybody's ready for the call. Um, landlords will try sometimes try to intimidate you, but fuck them. Um, there's a lot of, like, housing rights organizations and stuff like that. So, yeah, I don't know how I ended up here, Nick. Yeah. Uh, sorry. But, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's a big tangent. So then... So then what's happened? Like, I, I've noticed on your social media for Go Get em Tiger that you're posting almost daily, like, which shops are open. It's, it looks like a <laughs> like a ski lift, like, a you know, yeah. which slopes are open and which slopes are yep. closed, like, with an X yep. and a check mark. So yep. how are those decisions being made on a daily basis? Those decisions are being made mostly based on sales um, now. Uh when we made the decision to close GMB, if you've ever been to GMB, it's exposed on all four sides and there's no back of house and it's a big open air market with a lot of like, just a lot of people sort of smushed in there. Is the market open? The market is, so some of the vendors at the market are doing takeout and they have like a takeout area for pickup. Um, but most of the vendors there are closed and we shut down because it was just too, too much exposure. Uh, <clears throat> For our staff but we've actually since um it's kind been, of reopened yeah it's been open some of the days right yeah just at the sidewalk so you can come up to the sidewalk and get served at the sidewalk which which works really well i saw a, i think it was on twitter something about how uh they're being lax about parking enforcement which is usually a big issue over there <laughs> take advantage i mean you know don't pay rent park wherever right uh, that's, you know, if there's a silver lining. I, I mean, suppose. we've seen the Max, Mad Max movies. There's no parking enforcement in Mad Max. Yeah. In the Thunderdome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that analogy is going to become so real. Uh, too, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, so GMB, you know, it's, it just turns out that our neighborhood cafes still have a lot of demand. And the ones that are a little bit more linked to office, <laughs> bless you, uh, you, the ones that are a little bit more linked to like office or or you know some sort of working scenario are are pretty much dead so yeah we closed we closed those so if you don't you know we we can you can talk about or not talk about what you want obviously it's like how are you how are your numbers looking at your different cafes like not like oh, individually yeah. but just overview yeah so i mean overall because we've closed uh you know 35, 33% of our locations, our, our, uh, our numbers are down about 50%. Uh, 
um, in some of our cafes, individual cafes, they are down around 20%. Um, our Los Feliz shop is down close to 35%. Uh, we've managed to make up a lot of the difference by offering pantry staples. Mm. Uh, but I call that, if you're used to operating on coffee or food, prepared food margins, I call that like a, uh, uh, it's like a top line mirage. Uh, right. Uh, because the margin on that stuff is not real. Uh, <laughs> you know, like we're selling gallons of milk and that's $9, which is like a nice sale for a coffee shop. But like our cost is six seventy five. Right. You know? So, so, you know, I, had those been popular, that, the, the staple stuff, like the kind of more like turning into a makeshift grocery? Like I've seen that happen at your place and others. Um, I've been curious as to whether that's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do an aside here. I mean, when we talk about these things, there's like the sort of public facing, uh, here's how things are going great. Here's how things are going well and here's how things are going good. Sort of like spin right and mm. and and a lot of that ends up like i, I watched a uh a, a broadcast yesterday I'll, I'll just say it like square uh had like a town hall type thing oh, and yeah. these businesses were like yeah things are good people are really supporting us and you like listen closely as a business owner you're like oh you guys are fucked aren't you like you can tell by how they're talking about it that their sales are like you know 20 percent of what they were before they're barely scraping by but they're they're sort of forced in that situation to talk about what's going well. Um, mm. So in, in terms of like the pantry type stuff, like is that yeah. more like feel good type things or is that actually like a sig like significant meaningful, maybe is a better word, like meaningful uh, business wise, like revenue stream right now? It's 40% right now uh -huh. of our total sales. And, you know, our average check is now right around 20 bucks. So it is a meaningful chunk of the of the actual revenue, mm -hmm. um, and you know I I certainly am I am heartened by the response to that. I think some slice of our customers want to buy it from us because they want to see us stick around. Right. Um, I think another portion, and probably the bigger portion. Is buying it from us because it's more convenient, right? Like if you go to the grocery store, it's just it's, it's a shit like, show, it, dude. It's I mean honestly, can I just shout out Trader Joe's right now because Trader Joe's is actually doing a good job. They have the crowd control thing down, yeah, really really well, and I'm super impressed by by the way that they've handled it. And so I will shout out Trader Joe's, um, but otherwise it's it's like a it just feels apocalyptic yeah. and people are fucking clueless man like walking around putting their hands on everything yeah. and it's like you not watch the news like yeah. what's going on here yeah um so so with us you know you can have this contactless experience um where you don't even have to go inside and you can get a loaf of really good bread and you can get a dozen really great eggs and you can get delicious milk and now we have you know rice and beans and things that are hard to find and i think it's a good offering for this time. And so I think it, it sort of fits the, the adding value for our community goal. So talking about Trader Joe's and stuff, like you got into it a little bit there. What, talk, so you said they don't have, people who don't have to go inside, but they can? Where? At like, Trader Joe's? No, at your cafes. Like, how are you, yeah. how are things being set up? I mean, this has been a, this was sort of like the all consuming topic for me yesterday. I actually talked to a few food media folks trying to uh, convince them and sell the idea on like, someone needs to write a best practices guide on how to set up a food business right now. Because, you know, if I can go on a little thing, it's like you have on the one hand, the government saying, you know, stay home you know, shelter in place. And this, of course, is certain states, not all states. Shelter yeah. in place, don't go out. Also, go out and get some exercise, walk the dog. 
Also, food businesses stay open uh, if it's takeaway or delivery only. And that, like, go outside and then go, uh, I'm sorry, don't go anywhere and go do certain things you need to do, that's a contradiction. And uh, yeah. they're leaving it to individuals, individual businesses and individual people to figure out how to reconcile those two. And I'm not yeah. saying that the government is, like, you know, messing up in that regard. It's They're trying to figure out what to do just like the rest of us are. But... It still remains, you know, you know, I've been talking offline over chats and stuff about this, like, you know, being scrappy, being entrepreneurial, like thinking creatively and just realizing like it's not just an opportunity, like there is a necessity, like somebody needs to come out with something that people can follow and, and rely on. And so um, I think somebody's working on one right now. Uh, I, ho- I hope so. But like the ways that. I mean, I don't. You talk about grocery stores, like other places. I've fled two different lines. I, I got in line uh, for food at a couple different places, and within five minutes, I'm like, "Fuck this!" and I left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Both times because just there was no guidance. There was no guidance from any of the businesses, and I think for Trader Joe's, they're used to having that mentality of. We're going to craft us a, a, some experience for our customers. Like we're going to all yeah. wear, wear these goofy Aloha shirts because that's what we want people to see. Because that's going to make yeah. people feel a certain way, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, I you bagged on Trader Joe's a little bit on Twitter. I, my beef with Trader Joe's is that I don't like their signage. Like I, but I also understand. I get it. Like it makes sense. Like the hand, the hand signage stuff. Yeah, it's just it's like the Comic Sans of chalk, sort of like kind of hokiness. But also like it's totally hokey. That's the whole fucking. Thing, I know, man. I know. But that's where it's like I don't, I don't hate it. It's more like it's fun to just grumble about it, like a grumpy old guy. But cool. you know, for, for you, for you guys and for us, I think that you know we go into all of our situations thinking very much about the customer experience and focused on that. And, you know, not, there's no need to call anyone out because there's like so many people, you know, just trying to figure out what to do, but it's very plainly visible. uh, The businesses that are accustomed to thinking that way and are capable of pivoting sort of on top of that value sort of idea and Mm. the ones that aren't. um, Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, Nick, I, 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 early on, I, I was invited to be a part of this conference call with a lot of the sort of culinary leaders in, in LA. And I had gone into the call feeling like, all right, this is going to be like a real exchange of ideas and, and stuff like that. And it was just, it was just sad. Yeah. Nobody was talking about how they were going to fight to survive. They were all kind of wondering aloud, like, who was going to save them. And that's a perfectly on it, like a perfectly reasonable thing to wonder, because, you know, I think everybody's going to need something uh, to, to, to stay alive or most most companies are gonna need something. But um, I, I think there are very few people prepared to, like, change their game plan that quickly and. You know, I guess one of the most annoying things about working at Go Get Em Tiger <laughs> has been that Charles and I change things up a lot. We change up the menu, we change up elements of the service or the training documentation, and that's just been always kind of in our DNA. And uh, like Jamie Lau and a lot of like the key management staff have had to like tell people like, you know, like you'll get used to it. Change is just a part of, of being here. Uh, cause you know, the first rule of coffee retail is baristas resist change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It doesn't even matter what the change is. People are gonna say like, this is bad. Um, yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, oh, always, always. Um, well, it's cause you're kind of, you know, baristas are like, baristas are like drummers in a band, right? It's like everyone has a different role to play, but the baristas are like keeping the beat and just like with repetitive stuff. And if if you didn't, you know, get used to beating a drum a thousand times a second or whatever, then you wouldn't have that job. And so it makes sense that I bet drummers don't like change as much in bands either. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah. It's like, dude, your your Tom is over here now. Right. Ah, right. To work like this. Exactly. <laughs> That's a great. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, the puck press was like you know a minor revol almost caused a minor revolution in our shots. Oh really? Yeah. Um, do you use that? Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, it's a trade. It's, it's a, a little bit of a trade off. Yeah, it's a it's a great innovation. I just wish they. That's the trade off. That's the trade off. Um, I think you got to crank it up. The 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 power the Yeah, I think I think the trade off is that um, there's something to just having your hands on a thing. You know, I I have a I have a uh, I've talked about this sometimes. Like I have this. Uh, design in my head for like the perfect automated like brewing like drip coffee brewing thing and mm. uh, you know without giving out giving away too much like there's a manual part of it you know I want mm -hmm. there to be sort of a part where the barista or the home person like almost has a lever where they like raise and lower the shower head into the thing um, because cool. yeah because I think that that, that kind of connection um, you know, we're, we're human beings, like we want to hold, hold stuff. And like, you know, when it's just like a button to push and you stand back, it's, it's not as engaging. Um, so there's a yeah. little bit of a loss there, but it's, but you know, it's okay. You know what I mean? It's like, it, there's, cause there, when the benefits outweigh the, 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 the downside, then it's a no brainer. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I, as a barista, like I, I collected tampers and I remember just having like occasionally like taking them off the shelf and like you know like there was this sort of this precision this precise handmade thing it it is very like analog and and i think like one of the most romantic ways and a lot like uh a lot like you know hi-fi or like old cars or stuff like that like, right it's just like oh, it's like perfectly balanced and so there, there is something pretty real about about that but the consistency is if you crank it up we did a big test and i think you know if you do go any less than the max pressure it's pretty inconsistent ah actually. but you're you're using you're using vst baskets though oh well I don't see know. we don't we, cause we, we don't and so it's it's we, we're using more tapered simonelli baskets and so um okay. yeah we don't need to crank it up as much but that's different that's a whole other conversation always being cute <laughs> oh, you know, because I invented tapered baskets. Um, I mean, what do you? Are you able to see what else is happening in LA in terms of other cafes in your area as well? I mean, look, Verve, Intelligentsia, Blue Bottle, Dog Dinosaur, closed. Uh, Dinosaur, closed. Dinosaur closed. Yeah, I think Alfred closed. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, there's there's not a lot of us left standing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, I don't know yeah. if you want to get into it. Like, why do you think some of these companies are closing? Like, especially like a, we don't know. I'm, I've been, th I thought about reaching out to um, Brian Bean, who's CEO of Blue Bottle, to do one of these chats, just because I'm curious as to the mentality of that scale of business. Um, do you have any, like, have you heard anything or any like murmurs about some of the thought processes out there? Uh, I think that a, when I've talked to most leaders of, of small, smaller companies, um, they're just scared. And so they're just closing because they don't know what other choices they have. Right. Um, and I think like for Blue Bottle, I mean, I guess here's a question for you. <clears throat> if you had the money to do it and keep all of your team compensated at the same level, <clears throat> would you close? I mean, we haven't. And, uh, but, it, but if you had, if you had banked a month, like, easily a month's worth of payroll right plus tips like the whole thing <clears throat> i mean the, i think there's two different questions mixed up in the, into there one is if everything that i you know 
if it was us, me and Trish owning a business that was at that scale and then also had the funds, then the answer is no, like we would have closed. We would try to make it work. If the, the, the reason I say there's a second question there is that if like your blue bottle, for instance, um, their, their whole calculation about almost everything is different from you and me. You know, how they look at these things. I mean, when you're talking about venture-backed companies, um, you know, you're talking about a world where people will invest a million dollars in 50 different companies and with the hopes that one or two of them will become a billion dollar company. And so the idea of things shutting down is like you, if you're in that world, you don't take it that seriously. Like, you know, you, you get used to being like, oh, shucks kind of about it. But, you know, when it's, when, in, in your business, in your portfolio, each one of those companies represents like a roll of the dice in a way, like an educated roll of the dice, but a roll of the dice nonetheless. Then it's like, ah, you know, cost of business, you know, kind of thing. Um, I think as you scale, you start, people seem to appear to anyway, start to see their employees as more commodities than as, you know, as a vital part of their business. Um, they'll say it, but they'll but say that's so. not the actions of Blue Bottle indicate otherwise, right? Like, they're paying their team to not work. I guess so. I mean, I guess so. so. Same with Starbucks. Yeah. Is Starbucks, are they, we have so few Starbuckses in San Francisco that I don't even know. Are they open? I believe that they are closed. Yeah. Uh, or at least most of them are. I think uh, I saw one that was open. open. I think yeah. that's, that's it. They're, they're paying, how, paying their team. How for funny that we days. don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's good. It's good, I guess. I mean we'll see. We'll see how it all pans out. I mean, unfortunately, like this whole situation is putting a lot of pressure on these relationships. Um, I saw, you know, it's on public, and so, and I don't mean to talk shit, but like, uh, someone sent me a message yesterday. Like, have you seen the comments on side classes, Instagrams from the past four or five, you know, posts? And I'm like, no, I, I haven't. And you know, side class closed all their stores. Um, there's one in LA, I guess now, and, and the rest of them, like three of them here in San Francisco. The one in LA was open for like five minutes and then they closed. Yeah. Well, that was brand new too. And, yeah. um, but you know, so I went to the Instagram and I looked and it was full of angry comments from their former baristas who they laid off. And oh. I guess they just really mishandled, you know, from the point of view, at least from the baristas, they've really mishandled things. Um, and, and the messaging and such and such, but you know, but that's, I get, I, yeah. I mean, if I could give, like, if I could just give advice, because I've seen that a lot, like a lot of folks saying like that they have had similar experiences from their employers. Mm. Like it's not time to be cute. It's not time to keep your cards close to your chest. Like, right. like the, if you want like the, the best possible outcomes of the other, uh, on the other side of this, like build trust be fucking transparent with your team here is where we are like here's what we're doing we're taking pay cuts we're changing our offering we're trying to keep this alive if you can't work don't work if you want to work we have a job for you right like like here's my phone number let me know if you have any questions like here's what we're doing for you like i i just don't understand the like being cagey yeah, it doesn't matter how big you are. Like, why, why? How is that good? How is that helpful? Well, I understand. I understand why they do that. And you know, Kyle, you're talking about another way to rephrase everything you just said is the values that you have been operating on, that you have used to guide your process, you know, guide things, as well as like inform how you do everything. Like, keep doing those just in a different sort of way. That's what you're saying, and when you're talking about these companies, a lot of them anyway, it's that that's not they don't have those values to fall back on because that's not kind of the perspective that they've been coming from anyway. And you know, it's a little bit like uh, you know, like a lot of stuff. It's like it's like parenting techniques or like any kind of management stuff. It's like I I always appreciate conversations with you because I feel like we're mostly on the same page about. 
especially on the value side of things. And then I talk to other business owners who talk about their, you know, they're belly aching about their employees to me and Trish. And we're looking at each other like, no, man, you are not like us. Yeah. Like you do not, yeah. you know, see people in the same way. And, you know, it makes you wonder why. But it also it's like I can't tell them how to be. It's like I can only tell, you know, share about what we've done. Um, I, I cannot, like, it's funny when other business owners want to commiserate about him. Do you th- like? Am I? <laughs> do you think you're gonna like? I love like I love being an employer. We have 125 employees now, yeah. and uh, it's just like having this incredible extended community. And sure, like not you know not every employment experience that we've had as a company or that our employees have had historically has been great. Right. Definitely, that is the case. Right. And I would not even pretend for a moment that uh, I'm a perfect or even great employer. But I do love, like, if 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 you don't love people, I don't know how you do coffee retail. Yeah. Like, all about people. Yeah. And it's funny because I think my reputation is that I hate people and I'm grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. You think I so? do hate a lot, but I but I love. I, yeah, I think people are pretty scared of me. Uh, or a lot of people are scared of me in the coffee community. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Okay. I don't know. You know, I mean, not you. We've known each other for yeah, a while. Yeah. You've seen me since yeah. I was like nineteen. No, years I think old I just think I think back. To, I just think back to just rep, like you know you you do hear stuff through the grapevine and like what people assume. I, I just don't recall anyone saying that. But mm. anyway, um, have you been thinking about so you? So uh, some of what you said before about making plans about like what we're going to do if, you know, coming up. Um, I mean, for us, it's like sort of the same thing uh, where like the whole like moving our whole service to the window and serving out that way. um, That's something I thought about two weeks before we did it. Um, Alistair says that he's not scared of you, Alistair Dury. Oh, well, uh, Alistair, I've also known him for a long yeah, time. Yeah, Is he watching this? Yeah, he, I like he is. We don't see each other enough. Drew, Drew Catlin's on here. Yeah, some of our old, old friends. Um, oh, my gosh. It's like Coffee Circa 2005 yeah, it's, having it's, a reunion. Seriously. So <laughs> have, you, have you thought ahead anything else that you've kind of got, like, lo- loaded in the chamber, so to speak, in terms of, like, what if? Like, I've got some stuff I've been thinking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're constantly evolving the, the retail flow, uh, based on the, like what we're seeing in the customer behavior. Um, you know, the pantry thing, I think I I mentioned has been really successful. It's been a little bit tough to get a steady supply of that stuff. I'm sure. So, but what we want to do is like open that up so that people can get, produce and other necessities and just have them all bagged up and ready for them when they arrive. Um, just leaning more into the, the takeaway stuff and also being prepared for a potential order to cease our operations completely. Right. And, you know, I think we are just starting to think about what the world looks like, you know, when this does blow over, when this is, you know, for the most part in the rear view mirror, and not only like what new muscles are we building right now that we can continue to use in the future. Mm. Also like what's the landscape of retail? What's leasing looking like? What's, what's, uh, you know, employment looking like and, um, you know, how, how can we, you know, as a human being, I'm terrified about everything that's happening in the world right now. I just want to, qualify what i'm about to say next yeah. with that but as ceo and fiduciary of my, my company and steward of this company and uh you know of of all these jobs like i'm also trying to think about you know what what can accelerate our trajectory as a company sort of as we emerge from this and you know if you're a company that just closed and laid off all your staff what the fuck are you gonna do like true, like I like you're just gonna say like, all right, everybody come back. It's cool now. Right. I don't know. Is it cool now? Right. Maybe. Maybe not. And like, I'm not saying that it's the wrong answer, but that's that's scary to me. Yeah. Um. So you know, I think we want to be ready, ready for the world uh, post 
COVID-19. Well, what about, yeah. what about sooner than that? Like, so here's the question that I, I was thinking about this week or the like past couple days. What, ha- what are you going to do if someone in your cafe, what, at one of your cafe staff, one of your staff uh, gets sick and, and is diagnosed positive with coronavirus? I think we have to close that, that shop. I don't think that there's any other option. Yeah. And also everybody who, you know, was uh, interacting with that person needs to be quarantined. Yeah. So yeah. Here, yes. here's what I thought about. I'll share. Yeah. Uh, if someone gets sick, closes store, uh, everyone needs to, you know, basically like either go to uh, go home and whatever, like self-quarantine who worked with that that person everyone essentially everyone in that particular cafe but uh right after we close we would uh so someone else would come in and cl- we would clean up the cafe like disinfect it and then we would reopen yeah. as soon as we could with temporary staff of breezes laid off from other cafes that that's my that's my current sort of penciled in plan uh, contingency for if someone gets gets sick, uh, just because especially here in San Francisco, like there's just so many breezes that have been laid off. Um, I even thought about putting sort of a preemptive like you know waiting list type sort of thing just to kind of have, but that seems almost that seems unkind in a certain way, like a little bit too. Uh, I don't want to lead people on in that way. I feel like if and when we had to do that and we put the call out that we would get enough respondents to where um, we don't need to sort of put it out ahead of time. But yeah, that's what, one of the things I've been thinking about. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a pretty clever strategy. Um, it's something, yeah. you know, it, it's sort of like a, you know, it's not quite le- lemonade out of lemons, but uh you know, I, I don't, I don't think of it necessarily. I mean, I guess it, it is. It, it is still about the sustainability of the business and keeping it going. And I, and I talked to some of the, some of my baristas at our Berkeley cafe yesterday about this. And I was kind of expecting them to go, oh, well, that's, you know, okay. But they got really excited. And I realized in, in a way that I'm sure you've experienced this too, when you share something and then you realize like it's, so it's sort of like when, you know, people who make comedy movies say like, oh, sometimes people laugh at the things that I didn't know that they'd laugh at if they don't laugh at the stuff that whatever. Um, they're, they've focused immediately on the idea that, that after two weeks they would have a job again. Mm. You know, like that's where their head went. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, of course. And they're like, well, that's awesome. And I'm like, oh, I guess it is. Like, oh, I, I was thinking, you know, it, uh, yeah, it's 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 obviously a what if situation, and for a lot of people, you know, Alistair is saying it's probably it's probably inevitable that someone's going to get sick at, at almost every cafe eventually, but mm-hmm. um, but you know, it it's it, it uh, I I'm afraid and just because I think about these the sort of 360 degrees wise, I don't like the idea that someone might see if if we did do that that they would be like oh they're just like so committed to you know making money or whatever that like they're gonna like figure out any way to to reopen and for me it's like well that's related to being able to continue to pay people and continue to operate um for everyone um yeah i mean you know opinions uh people i'm sure have expressed their opinions to you about the choices that you're making yeah and people certainly have expressed them to us as well. And, you know, at a certain point, like, you just have to take the, you know, the best of the knowledge that's available to you. Yeah. And you have to, you know, if you've, if you've built up a, a sort of morals or values-based sort of compass in your company to direct your decision-making, like, you know, dust that stuff off and remind yourself why the fuck you're here. Uh, and if you haven't, well, no time like the present. Right. Uh, decide what you want your company to mean, and and tune out the noise, uh, you know, and focus on the stakeholders and what matters to them, and and that's that's like 
that's all, all you can do. You know, I think if we, you know, when we closed GMB, we got flack for closing GMB and not, not stating publicly what our plan was for our, that team. And when we reopened GMB, we got flack for reopening GMB. Right. Um, but I think, you know, the truth is if you came to the shops, you would see, you know, that it, you know, it was really like the operation you're, you're so far away from anybody and there's no touching and it's, it's just so, so pared down. Um, but like, you know, now is, and this is the problem with not having good public sector leadership in this world, you know, like it's, it's, there is no guidance. If you look back like at the history of the united states in these crisis moments whether it's the cuban missile crisis or the financial crisis in 2008 or you know the new deal world war ii like like there has always been like a strong message of like here's what we're going to do as a nation now and the absence of that in this moment and the fact that actually what is coming out of the white house is is potentially harmful yeah uh this is this is new and it really does come down to you nick cho like you're making the choice like there's no the, the like society is not making the choice about how to best come at this there's there's no real guidance like the government wants to keep restaurants open because it's a it's a few million jobs you know and well people got to eat and people have to eat but you know like every once in a while like the health department in LA county drafted this four page memo about like best practices and like, is it really best practices? I, like, I don't know. Everybody's making it up. Oh, they put something out? They did. They did. Uh, oh, can you send it to me? I want to see it. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It looks It is. A, looks like a legal document, but I will definitely send it to you. Yeah. No, I, I like looking at stuff like that. Yeah. No, I mean, that, I think this is a good place to start wrapping up. I mean, I know that, like I said before, um, I'm thinking about best practices for everyone, yeah. and the fact that, like, again, most people are trying to we have to figure it out for ourselves. I was thinking about how, essentially, our standard is uh, zero touch, and right. uh, and that someone can come to your place and not have to be within six feet of anyone, except for, of course, like the person at the counter. Um, you know yeah. that you know. For us, we put the plexiglass shield up, which kind of like shrinks that zone down a little bit. But um, that's kind of as complicated, as, as easy and complicated as it is, right? Like that's it. Yeah. Like zero touch and uh, safe distance. And if you know, I've been thinking about how like there, not not to make this about marketing or whatever, but that there should be some kind of list of people who self-report and say like, we're pledging that our business is adhering to those two core sort of things, just because there's so few right now. And yeah. you know, but that would represent a lot better guidance than um, any of the other stuff that we've been getting. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, um, this is a moment where, you know, leaders can lead. Uh, and whether you sort of depend, like, see yourself as a leader of the industry or a leader of your own company. I think you tend to see yourself as a leader of the industry. I tend to see myself as a leader of my own company uh, more. Um, and I mean, you also lead your own company. Yeah. So you're, no. you're, you're a two for one uh, package. Uh, <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> but, um, you know, now's the time for people to, to, to step into that vacuum and say like, here's best practices. I mean, in a little way, even just like our, when we published our unbranded house rules, uh, which were much lighter than what they, they are now. Right. You know, like a lot of other shops were very grateful and they took it and adopted it and posted it in their own cafes, which yeah. I thought was really, really cool yeah. and kind of affirming, you know, to see yeah. that happen. I am interested yeah. along those lines. Uh, I've been, reaching out to 
the folks who are, you know, who are friends, cafe owners here in San Francisco and in the Bay Area. And I have a few more calls and text messages to send out. But I, last night, actually, I was thinking, like when I in, uh, invited you to do this with me today, um, I was thinking about how best to work with our local fellow cafes. Because, you know, this goes back to some of the stuff that you said at the beginning and just through, through this whole conversation. Um, you know, there are food businesses, there's restaurants, and then there's like coffee shop cafes. And they're, they're, you know, we know, like, they're super different. Like, I don't know about L.A., uh, but everywhere, you know, D.C. and then here in San Francisco, it's like the local, uh, uh, what do you call it? The local government sometimes doesn't know how to categorize us, right? It's like, well, you're yeah. like, oh, well, we have to treat you as if you're, like, handling raw chicken and such and such. It's like, no, <laughs> it's, we don't do that. Yes. You know, so we kind of fall in this sort of interesting spot when it comes to this coronavirus crisis uh it just again goes to show like we're different from other places a lot of the you know places and you mentioned it before too like chefs who are so much better at what i'll never be as good at anything as they are at what they do like they're not able to make their business work right now because there's not really a place for a three michelin star sort of chef in the coronavirus world right now um charging 200 200 for a takeaway dinner doesn't really fly right now and even if it is something that's more reasonable no one eats the same lunch every day like not a lot of people anyway um but they do go get the same coffee every day you know from the same place where they can um yeah historically coffee is very the demand for coffee is inelastic now the way that people are are getting it might change right and, and the level of of the coffee that they can afford might change but right. i think over history the actual variance on the trajectory of coffee consumption is basically below the margin of error of data reporting yeah it could, it just continues on I the was same path. talking to peter giuliano yesterday on the phone and he was saying that like through this where he's you know his sort of geeky brain has gone is trying to dig up as much as he can about the state of coffee and things through the, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, mm, you know, and what he said, uh, told us yesterday, which was really interesting is that there's a bunch of coffee companies that ex- some of which ex- still exists to this day that started in 1919 and 1918. Um, so, you know, again, not to whatever lipstick on a pig or whatever, but that you know there's evidence of a lot of opportunity through uh these crises and and after i mean we we, remains to be seen and again like i i don't like sort of uh that kind of cheesy feel good sort of stuff like silver lining type type conversations but it's good to keep one eye on you 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 should be paying attention to the stories right if you're like an entrepreneur you have a business owner like you should be paying attention to what companies did survive through incredible hardship? Um, because, like, what's unique about this moment is, I think you know, the Spanish flu is one half of the historical analog that we should be looking at. It's really like the Spanish flu meets the Great Depression, right? Um, which is fucking just terrifying and scary when you think about it that way. But that's that is really the scale of of this thing yeah um, cool and, well kyle thanks for doing this keep mm-hmm. keep, keep in touch Thank you. we might you know I, i'm i'm still trying to figure out how to schedule these things with different people but maybe we'll you know we'll, we'll chat again like this yeah 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 man i'm 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 at home for the most part yeah uh, so all right all right thanks thanks everyone be well thanks y'all